cosmos, creator, and human destiny. And that's the topic I'm going to speak on. Not easy to cover any much of that in a short time. Why would I go to something like that? Well, President Bush um, gave quite a speech to NASA about two years ago, I think it was. He said, uh, well, he talked about our space program and how just like the early explorers, they had to get to the new world and we've got to get to other worlds and we've got to have hands-on, not just enough to see it through a telescope. We want to be there and handle it. And uh, he has a big program there involved. Billions more are being spent on it. We're going to put men back on the moon. And uh, then we're going to have a colony on the moon. And from the moon, we're going to go to Mars. And it will make it much easier to explore the universe. And uh, so the title of my first chapter in the book is America's Space Program. Now, this is lunacy, uh, <laughs> ju just, to, just to be blunt. Uh, I want you to know what I really mean. Uh, <laughs> I'm not a space scientist. You know, you, I, would you people pray for me? This is a, no, this is a book I think will be very, very important. Uh, I'm coming up against... PhDs in genetics and astrophysics and physics and chemistry, et cetera, et cetera. And what do I have? A BA in mathematics, and I'm a CPA. So, <laughs> um, by the way, somebody, one of the speakers said I have a degree in accounting. No, I do not have a degree in accounting. I have a, uh, a degree in math from UCLA. I took my accounting by correspondence, okay? How about that? And I passed the CPA exam. I didn't have any problem. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, um, I'm just going to take these guys on, okay? I don't know if you're aware of it. Uh, have you, anybody, read about the, or know about the new atheists? Anybody? Nobody. Oh, two, two people, okay. <laughs> well, who are the new atheists? These guys are going to, they say, well, Richard Dawkins, some of you would know Richard Dawkins, one of the world's leading evolutionists, uh, written a number of books. Richard Dawkins is probably the leader of it, a young man named uh, Sam Harris, quite brilliant. Uh, and um, their books are high on the New York Times bestseller list. Uh, they are making waves, big waves, in Time Magazine, the media, and so forth. What are they up to? They say that belief in God is not just stupid, it is evil. <laughs> We're, we are going to expunge this from society. And they say, we have no choice but to launch an evangelistic campaign. That's what they call it. They're going to evangelize the world for atheism, okay? Now, there are a lot of ways to look at this. On the one hand, you could say, well, they're not doing a very good job. Uh, for example, I, we used to travel behind the Iron Curtain, uh, Russia and other communist countries. And you know, the Soviet Union for 70 years tried to destroy all belief in God. They didn't make any headway. Uh, however, and of course, the polls are, are quite uniform year after year in the United States. The polls show 92 to 95 percent of all Americans believe in God, much higher percentage than any other country in the world. But what God do they believe in? That's a problem, see? We've got a lot of people who are very religious, or they say they believe in God. It's Star Wars for some higher power, higher than what? What do you mean a power? And so forth. Um, so although the atheists are complaining, they're not making much headway. 
On the other hand, they may be making more headway than you imagine. And um, I know we've got some parents out there. Um, I have four children, 10 grandchildren. I would just suggest this. You don't know what that young person is thinking. You may think you do, but they could have thoughts that you they're not sharing with you. I have met too many former born-again <laughs> uh, Christian young people, and when they got to university, uh, they got into industry, they met some challenges, they ran into some bright atheists who gave them all kinds of arguments that they had never heard of. Number one, you better, gi you better give them the, the solution to these arguments before they hear them. And that's where I think a lot of our churches and Sunday schools are falling down. We don't need any more hoopla, you know. Let's get excited. Whoa, whoa. Um, I, I, well, I'm not against getting excited, but I got to have something really to get excited about. Uh, when we see the Lord, <laughs> we'll be excited. But uh, I have met too many, and I've probably mentioned some of them before, and I, I won't go into the details. Well, I'll, I'll give you one example. <laughs> one example you've probably heard, heard me mention, because some of them are outstanding. Well, I sat next to one yesterday on the plane. The Lord sits me next to people that he wants me to sit next to. We had a nonstop three-hour conversation from Portland to, to Chicago. You can pray for him. Uh, but, uh, and he was very, very interested. But here's a young man. His words were, when I was in high school, I received Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Now, I don't believe in him anymore. Well, what do you think about Jesus, I asked him. Well, he's a good man. You couldn't deny that. Well, you know what I would say. Well, you can't be serious. Jesus couldn't be a good man. If he's just a man, he couldn't be a good man because he said he was God. He said he would rise from the dead. He said he would judge the world. He said he's the only savior, the only hope. If he's only a man and he's not who he claimed to be, then he's either a lunatic, a self-deluded egomaniac, or he is a deliberate liar. But you couldn't say he's a good man. Now, you've got to face what Jesus said about himself. You can't just brush it off, okay? Sitting next to another man, he's high up in the, in the uh, world of... Uh, air, air, aircraft, air, uh, airlines, actually. And here were his words. When I was in university, I became a born-again Christian. Now I don't know what I believe anymore. I said, I can prove God exists. I can prove Jesus is the true and only Savior of, of, of the world. I can prove the Bible is God's word. He said, can you do that? Would you help me? See, there are people, I just met him on an airplane. There are, there are people like this everywhere. And, oh, here, I'm, I'm speaking at a conference in the East. A mother take, brings her, I think, 21-year-old son, drives several hundred miles to, to come to this conference and asks me, would you spend some time with my son? Well, yes. Why? Well, he was so active, went on a mission, taught Sunday school. Now he's in an atheist club and denies everything. This is going on, folks. <laughs> and there could be more um, people, they certainly don't have a, a biblical view of God. And we need to understand this. And uh, how are they doing? How, how are they making this crusade? Well, with science, so-called, okay? So President Bush gave a speech, and uh, as I mentioned, he says, we are launching into the cosmos. We're gonna build new vehicles. 
uh, capable of doing this, and so forth. So I begin the book by just giving a few statistics. Uh, 30 years ago, we sent Voyager 1 and 2 out into space. Remember? They got that gold record on there. Sign, uh, signed by Jimmy Carter, so-called Christian. Uh, not a Christian by any means, and I don't know if you've read his latest book. Partition, not apartheid. Okay. He is so anti-Israel. 24 of the members of his um, nonprofit group resigned in protest. Uh, he is pro-Arab, pro-Islam, anti-Israel, and really anti-God. But uh, anyway, Jimmy Carter, what did he say on that gold record? You probably Some of you would remember. Well, it was uh, partly put together, actually, by Carl Sagan. Sagan the pagan. Uh, well, uh, it's not a false accusation. He worshipped the cosmos. Sagan said, well, if we need something to worship, how about the sun and the moon and the stars? That's paganism. Wow, in the presence of the cosmos. Oh, the cosmos. The cosmos brought us forth. Uh, so we're all creatures of the cosmos, creatures of a big bang. Uh, and they're buying this because these are the guys that have the degrees and that impress people. Well, so we sent Voyager out there and on the gold record, and Carter in that said, uh, this is a message from a small planet and so forth. He was... He said, uh, I think he said at that time, 200, this is 76, I believe, or 77, uh, 200 nations rapidly becoming one, <laughs> one world. He was more honest with the extraterrestrials than he was with his constituents. Uh, but this was his ambition. And he said, anyway, he said, we hope someday, uh, having solved our problems, to join a community of galactic civilizations. And he said, this is our hope in a vast and awesome universe. It caused me to write a book. Some of you may have read it. Whatever happened to heaven? Oh, our hope in a vast and awesome universe is to join a community of galactic civilizations? Uh, well, so I just show it, it'll never happen. 30 years, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 are just now exiting the influence of our sun. Just now they've come to the edge of the solar system after 30 years. Voyager 1 is aimed at Alpha Centauri, 4.3 light years away, not very far in cosmic distances. How long do you think it will take them to get there? 77,000 years. <laughs> However, they will not never get there because their batteries are about to run out in a couple of years, and they will be floating, drifting through space, very expensive cosmic junk. Um, now, well, people say, yeah, but look, I mean, we've got radio telescopes, and we can communicate by radio. We're sending out beams out there. I'm, I'm just trying to be logical, okay? We're beaming messages out there by radio, and radio travels at the speed of light. That's 186,000 plus miles per second. Wow. Uh, that is fast by Earth standards. That is nothing in the cosmos, okay? At the speed of light, it would take you 100,000 years to cross our galaxy, the Milky Way. 250,000 years to circle around it. Millions and billions of years to reach other galaxies. And there, the latest figures are one trillion galaxies. Okay, now I'm trying to encourage these guys. I say, well, you want to uh, examine the, you know, learn all you can about the solar system. That's great. Uh, you're not going to get beyond that. But, uh, I mean, you think you're learning something about the cosmos, Look, there are 200 billion 
stars like the sun in our galaxy, the, uh, uh, the Milky Way, there are about one trillion galaxies, most of them much larger than our galaxy. So what is the sample that you have? You have one trillionth of one two hundred billionth of the solar system. I mean, if Barna took a poll like that, <laughs> well, yes, we got a big sample, folks. We got one trillionth of one two hundred billionth of the opinion out there. I don't think it would mean much, would it? I'm, I'm not trying to put anybody down. I'm, I'm, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not trying to say that you haven't accomplished a great deal to get to the moon, but I'm just saying, what have you done? Okay? Now, we sent a message, a, a radio message at a group of, a cluster of stars called M13. It will take 25,000 years for our radio message at the speed of light to get to M13. Another 25,000 years to get a reply back. Uh, you, you put an ad in the Wall Street Journal. We got the greatest investment. It will pay 1 billion percent. Well, when does it pay off? Well, 50,000 years from now. I don't think you could raise a dime. But our government is spending money on this sort of thing. Can you imagine? We're spending money to get some kind of information from, you know, 50,000 years in the future? you got to be kidding. It is not going to happen. Now, you know Stephen Hawking. Uh, he, uh, uh, MS, does he have, or, I don't know, he's in a wheelchair, he's got terribly handicapped, and he speaks through an amplifier. Very brilliant guy, mathematician. He just received the highest uh, scientific award that England uh, passes out. And uh, they took his gold, his medal, uh, a British a astronaut took his medal up to the space platform in honor of him because of his interest in space and so forth. Uh, Stephen Hawking says the human race is going to be destroyed. I mean, the chances are some huge meteor, there's going to be some collision We've got to populate other planets in the universe. We've got to get out there. We've got to build these colonies and so forth. Uh, I mean, the human race is in danger. Well, guys, if we're all the result of a Big Bang, and it's just been progress proceeding by chance, what are we concerned about? I mean, we don't mean anything. This whole universe is dying, second law of thermodynamics. One day, it will all be gone. I mean, it won't be gone, but it'll be dead, approaching absolute zero everywhere. All the plans and dreams and corporate screams and ambitions of man will be like sandcastles washed out into a cosmic ocean of nothingness. It'll be as though it had never been. Why are you so concerned? I come from Oregon. We're all concerned about the holy, or I'm sorry, sacred owl out there, uh, <laughs> spotted owl. I was sitting next to a, a scientist from the, well, the Lord sits me next to interesting people, as I say, sitting next to a scientist from the Oregon Museum of Science and Industry. I had a, I had a very interesting time. I said, why are we so concerned about the, the spotted owl? Why, why are we concerned about endangered species. Well, he said, we ought to be concerned about Well, I said, I thought that was how evolution worked. <laughs> I thought it was survival of the fittest. If those critters can't survive on their own, let them go. <laughs> I, I'm just trying to be logical. Doesn't that make sense? How come here we are pretty late down the, down, down the road in the evolutionary process? Why are we getting our finger in the pie? All worried about we're going to... No, look, that's the way 
That's the way evolution does it. Let, a, let evolution do it, okay? Well, too much to talk about, but um, so it all started with a Big Bang. Now, I think most Christians believe in the Big Bang. I'll tell you, I don't believe in the Big Bang. There are a lot of reasons why I don't believe in the Big Bang, and I can't go into them, but I'll just give you, <laughs> I'll just give you one thing to think about. We have a gentleman back there, a scientist. By the way, he's one of those that received that um, most notable award from England to name Louis Pasteur. You all know his name because you get pasteurized milk. And what did he prove? He proved that there is no such thing as spontaneous generation. You don't get life from dead matter, okay? There's no life in dead matter. It takes life to produce life, all right? They call that the law of biogenesis. Life only comes from life. Now, we got a big bang. It has sterilized everything a billion times over. There ain't no life. But here we are. <laughs> well, I guess life does come from dead things after all. And I quote a few Nobel Prize winners in the book. Uh, here's George Wald, Nobel Prize winner, Harvard professor, uh, retired now. He may not still be living, I'm not sure. But anyway, he says, we all know that Pasteur, I mean, what he has proven, we all know that the law of biogenesis is just as sure as any of the laws of thermodynamics. We all know that life can't come from dead matter, but here we are, I guess, as the product of spontaneous generation. The only way you can explain it, because otherwise you've got to believe in some miraculous supernatural act of creation. I quote another geneticist, Lewinton. He says, we will follow science no matter how stupid its, its proposals are, and some of them are, because, and these are his exact words, we will not allow a divine foot in the door. These men, unless they repent sooner, they are going to regret that for all eternity. That will haunt them. But so this is where we are, okay? It's, it wasn't always this way. The, the early scientists, in fact, the founders of science, let me name, name some of them for you. Louis Agassiz, founder of glacial science. Sir Francis Bacon established a scientific method of inquiry based on experimentation and inductive reasoning. These are all, uh, not all of them were Christians. They all believed in God, but most of them were Christians. Sir Charles Bell, first to extensively map the brain and the nervous system. Robert Boyle, founder of Boyle's Law for gases. Who they still study that today. It's one of the most complicated things you ever ran into. Who, by his will, endowed the Boyle Lectures, still carried on today at Oxford University. These are his words in his will, quote, for proving the Christian religion against notorious infidels. And they are still doing those lectures today. Oxford University happens to be where Richard Dawkins is one of those notorious infidels. Um, what about Nicholas Copernicus, who set forth the first mathematically based system of planets orbiting the sun? George Cuvier, founder of comparative anatomy. John Dalton, father of modern atomic theory. Rene Descartes, mathematician, scientist, and philosopher called the father of modern philosophy. Jean-Henri Favre, chief founder of modern entomology. Michael Faraday, one of the greatest scientists of the 19th century, who revolutionized physics with his work on electricity and magnetism. James Joule, discoverer of the first law of thermodynamics. William Thomas Kelvin, 
among the first to clearly state the second law of thermodynamics. Johannes Kepler, mathematician, astronomer, discovered the laws of planetary motion. I can go on and on, James Brooke Maxwell and so forth. I've given you already too many. These men believed in God, okay? Today you get the impression that scientists don't believe in God anymore. Uh, someone has put it like this. The, not only were the founders of modern science Christians, it is no coincidence they were all part of a Christian culture. I use Christianity, Christian in a broad term, but nevertheless, they were part of a culture that believed the universe made sense because God created it, okay? This a person has asked this question. Why? were these great men of science part of a Christian culture, and why do they not have any counterparts in any other culture? Where is the Greek version of Newton? Where is the Muslim version of Kepler? Where is the Hindu version of Boyle? Where is the Buddhist version of Mendel? Such questions are all the more powerful when you pause to consider that science studies universal truths. How is it? that so many other cultures, some existing for thousands of years, failed to discover or even anticipate Newton's first law of motion or Kepler's laws of planetary motion. So it's not just that the Christian religion is associated with the birth of modern science, but that modern science was not birthed in cultures which lacked the Christian religion. That's just a simple fact. Uh, and yet today, who is consulted by the media? You want to talk to a scientist? Okay, well, uh, we'll, uh, we'll get Richard Dawkins on the phone or in front of our camera. These, so you get the impression now that, you have to, that science, science is, is atheistic. What difference does it make? Well... Uh, Sir Francis Crick, um, you know, co-discoverer of, of the genetic, uh, the gene, the genetic language, and so forth. He wrote a book. I have to read all these guys' books. I got to know what they say, what, how they think, and so forth. His book is entitled. Well, the subtitle is The Astonishing Search for the Soul. But by soul, he does not mean what we mean. He does not mean what the Bible means. You have to be careful with the language they use. Now, he's not searching for the soul, as we understand it. He is searching for some thing, some law, some principle that will explain everything without the soul. Okay? That's what he means. Uh, he titles his book, The Astonishing Hypothesis. Now let me read the opening statements of that book. I think you'll be astonished too. He says, quote, The astonishing hypothesis is that you, your joys and your sorrows, your memories, your, into, your ambitions, your sense of personal identity and free will, are in fact no more than the behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. You think you think? You think you have opinions? You think that you have joys and sorrows and fears and you really love uh, your, your spouse or whatever? It's just a delusion. You are just a bag of molecules. <laughs> You began with a big bang, and that's what all it is. Well, and of course, as various people have pointed out, if that's what we are, then this is what uh, uh, Darwin's theory states. Well, then Darwin's theory is just the product of, of natural selection also. He's just a bag of molecules, too. So why should we believe what one bag of molecules says more than what another bag of molecules says? It doesn't make sense. There is no meaning. I think one of my talks is going to be why 
can't science tell us why? You ask why. Why are we here? They can't tell you. So we all began with a big bang, and Richard Dawkins, he's really the leader of the, the, these new atheists. Let me quote him. He says, the nucleotide building blocks come in only four different kinds. We're talking about the gene now, the genome. And, well, look, we all begin as a, as a single cell the size of a period at the end of a sentence in your Bible. Now, how does that single cell know how to build a body with 100 trillion cells, thousands of different kinds of cells. You know, nanochemical machinery the size of a thousandth of the width of a human hair going through processes that are beyond our comprehension to this day. single cell is more complex than New York City. And how does this little tiny bit of matter know how to instruct all of those cells to build this body? Well, you know, natural processes, uh, natural selection, survival of the fittest. No, I remember when I was undergraduate at UCLA, of course, you had to take some of these courses. The professor said, well, you know, we can explain the human eye. Uh, it began as an irritation on the skin. And uh, then over, uh, you know, billions of years, through natural processes, natural selection, and so forth, it finally developed to the eye that we have today. <laughs> I raised my hand. I, I was never intimidated by these guys. I said, well, now wait a minute. You just contradicted natural selection. You used Darwin's theory to contradict Darwin's theory. You can't build an eye piecemeal. An eye will not help this critter survive until it works. Now, if you've got parts of this eye in a process you're building over a period of millions of years and it doesn't work, natural selection is going to jettison them because natural selection is in the business of throwing out the stuff that won't survive and keeping what it makes some progress. And natural selection could never know that some a rod or a cone, you know, uh, or some dangling nerve, uh, out there that's eventually going to connect to the brain. Could, it doesn't know what this is going to do. Get rid of it. This isn't any... Are you following me? <laughs> never. It would never work. But they believe it. Why? Because they will not allow a divine foot in the door. So Richard Dawkins, so how does that little tiny cell know what to do? DNA. Richard Dawkins calls it the, uh, a blueprint. This is the instruction manual. This is DNA. It's written in letters. It's written in words. It is written in a language. It is encoded by certain protein molecules, and only certain protein molecules can decode it. Now... Listen to what he says. The, mo the nucleotide building blocks come in only four different kinds, whose names may be shortened to A, T, C, and G. Now listen, you probably never heard this. But this is the truth. We'll, we'll accept this from Richard Dawkins. He's supposed to be an expert. He wrote The Selfish Gene. These are the same in all animals and plants. Whoops. A G building block for a man is identical in every particular to a G building block from a snail. How about that? 
But the sequence of building blocks is not only different from that in a snail, it is also different, though less so, from the sequence of every other man, except for the special case of identical twins. Now, you've got a four-letter alphabet written in words, a language. It is so incredibly organized. Everything has the same DNA. Plants, snails, whatever. But every species is differentiated. And there is a barrier between species that cannot be passed. You see, a major problem with, um, with natural selection. Look, okay. This is information. This is God's Word. It's written in ink on paper. Did the ink or the paper or both of them together in some partnership originate the information? When you see information, it's telling you something. It's instructing you. It's giving you knowledge and so forth. It could only come from an intelligence. And the information on DNA could only come from the supreme intelligence. A pinhead's worth of DNA, if you put it in, in books, it would take a stack of books 500 times as high as the distance from here to the moon to contain the information in a pinhead's worth of DNA. Now, we don't have computers that can do that. Now, it's, well, I think I might talk somewhat about this Sunday morning or in some relationship to it. But one of the things that we learned, very interesting, I love this book, the Bible. Wow, you're not going to escape this. What's it called? The Word of God. Jesus is the Word, the living Word. God said, let there be light, and there was light. Okay. Now, we now know what, what Darwin never knew. We know a lot of things Darwin never knew. I think if he knew him, he would have never come up with ridiculous theory. But anyway, uh, people, they love it because it's a way to escape from God. But we now know there is no life without words. You understand? No life, with no physical life without words. You've got to have the DNA. Of course, we got a lot of problems, a lot of chicken and egg problems. Which came first, chicken or the egg? Well, you can't have life without life. Life only comes from life. Uh, DNA makes protein. But DNA is made of protein. And it's no good without protein to uh, crack the code and, you know, and so forth. Which came first, the DNA that makes the protein or the protein that DNA is made out of? Oh, you got dozens of those problems. You can't have a cell. With, well, the same about the eye. I just said, you can't have an eye unless the whole thing is there and it works. So which came first, the parts or the eye? No, it had to come at once because it's, it, it doesn't work uh, otherwise. Okay, so DNA is telling, it's, uh, it's the manufacturer's instructions how to build and operate this incredible body. Someone has said, you know, the body is about 100 trillion cells. To view just half of your genome, you would have to view 10 nucleotides every second for 40 hours per week for 40 years. And the apparent simplicity of this language is very deceiving. Geneticists can't even begin to fathom how, how, this, how this works. Let me quote Richard Dawkins again. As an adult, you consist of a thousand million million cells. But when you were first conceived, you were just a single cell endowed with one master copy of the architect's plans. See, here, they got a problem. They will not allow a divine foot in the door, but they can't really talk about what, what exists without plans, 
architect's plan, master plan, you know, uh, they cannot describe what is there without acknowledging there is some intelligence behind this. Even uh, Stephen Hawking says, it's very difficult to talk about the origin of the universe without thinking of God. <laughs> well, of course it is. There's no other explanation. It won't work. Uh, well, he says, the coded message of the DNA is translated into another alphabet, the alphabet of amino acids, which spells out protein molecules. Proteins not only constitute much of the physical fabric of the body, they also exert sensitive control over all the chemical processes inside the cell, selectively turning them on and off at precise times and in precise places. Now listen to this. Exactly how this eventually leads to the development of a baby in the womb is a story which it will take decades, perhaps centuries, for embryologists to work out. I mean, it just happened by chance, folks, but we can't even figure it out. Uh, well, I quote, in contrast to that, what did Solomon say in Ecclesiastes? As thou knowest not how the bones do grow in the womb of her that is with child, so thou knowest not the works of God who maketh all. This is the work of God. And he has hidden it from you. You will never get to it. So that just as space is so vast, we will never be able to explore it. You're not going to get out there, guys. You're kidding yourselves. You, you cannot do it. You're wasting your money. Why not admit it? No, it's pride. Pride that drives this. We can do it. We can create paradise. We're going to... What is it? We're going to run the show. DNA is the instruction manual. What is cancer? I know some of you are praying for our daughter, our eldest daughter, Jana. She's, you know, she's still surviving. She's in a big battle with cancer. What is cancer? Well, it's a single cell that isn't obeying the DNA anymore. It kicked over the traces. It's doing its own thing. And that's what sin is. That's what man is. Man is like a cancer on this earth. He's not following the Ten Commandments. He's not following God's law written in his conscience. He's doing his own thing. And he's going to have to be excised. He's going to have to be cut out. God cannot allow this to go on forever. You know, it's, I just try, I have a simple mind, I just try to be logical. If I went to the racetrack, and every day I bet on the same old nag that could hardly stagger out of the starting gate, never finished a race yet, but I keep putting my money on that horse, you would have reason to believe that my... <laughs> My love for that horse far exceeded my common sense. Look, who, who got us in the mess we're into today? It wasn't some extraterrestrials. You can't say, Satan made me do it, the devil made me do it. We did it. We did it to ourselves, didn't we? Yeah, but we're the, we're, we'll solve it. Let's have another peace um, conference, you know, and we're going to get all the religions together, like Roger's been uh, pointing out. Uh, we can do it. We can pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. We don't want a divine foot in the door, and science is going to lead the way. And this belief in God is really evil, and we're going to have to get rid of it. Now, this is the world that your young people live in. They've got to find a natural explanation for everything. They will not allow God to be involved. They have put him out. Just as he's not allowed in the equation. So I point out in the book, you know, the, well, you remember the uh, 
the trial, what was it called? Uh, the monkey trial? Stokes, right. The infamous Stokes trial. What, what, what was it all about? Well, you guys are teaching the Bible in public schools. You ought to at least allow, scopes, I'm sorry. Uh, you ought to at least allow uh, an alternative, evolution. Don't just monopolize this thing. Let there at least be another alternative. Okay. So they won the trial. I mean, it was a joke, a tooth of a peccary. They named Nebraska man. But anyway, like a bunch of other frauds. Now, what's the case today? Only evolution can be taught. You cannot have, uh, in any science class, you cannot have uh, the alternative possibility even presented. Maybe this is created by God. Why is that? Because we won't allow a divine foot in the door. Because God is ruled out by very definition. So I point out, you know, who is the most um, objective about this? Well, you've got atheists who say, we can't allow, you know, these Christians, they're prejudiced. They believe in God. It's going to uh, color their research. Really? Well, we have Christians who believe in evolution. Now, I don't. I think they're way wrong. But theistic evolutionists. See, the Christian, we are so confident of, of our, our faith in God and of his word. You never disprove this to me because it can't be disproved. I don't care what you come up with. I'll show you that this book is true. So look, I'm not afraid. Look, uh, so we have Christians. They're not afraid of evolution. Okay, you want to say that that's the way God did it. I don't believe God would do it that way. It's a very cruel way. It's a very slow, ponderous way over millions of years uh, at the cost of billions and billions of creatures, you know. Uh, but um, anyway, we're, we're still Christians. Evolutionist, an atheist, he couldn't possibly allow belief in God. That destroys his whole thing. So who is prejudiced? The atheist is prejudiced. It's not the Christian who is a scientist who, who is prejudiced. Now, where, where does this all go? and <laughs> Why all this talk about this kind of stuff? I think it's very relevant in the world we live in. This is the world that your young people face, or older ones as well. This is what you get on TV. It's what you get in science, film, science fiction films. This is what you get from... Uh, from Discovery Channel, from the nature programs. This is the only thing that comes out, okay? They, the world is being bombarded with evolution, which is designed to prove that there is no God. It all happened without God. And we better wake up and begin to combat this with the truth, with facts. I mean, people are really enamored with the space program. I mean, we're like a, our space program. I'm sorry, I don't want to be uh, disrespectful, but it's, I've probably said this before. It's like an ant crawling up on a blade of grass, and he yells down to the other ants, I'm exploring the world. He hasn't even begun to explore the lawn. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's even worse than that. It, it's, it's ludicrous. But this is what people go for. This is science. Science can do anything. Well, where, where is this taking us? There are questions. We'll talk about them tomorrow, I guess, that science can't answer. Where did I come from? Where am I going? Everybody thinks about that. I can prove to them very quickly. You are not just a bag of molecules. You are a thinking person who makes choices. The guy that puts a gun to his head, pulls the trigger, can only be assured of one thing. He stopped the function of the brain cells. He did not. That bullet whew, missed the real person that he is. Your brain doesn't think. You've heard me say that many times. 
if your brain originated your thoughts, you're a prisoner of your brain, wondering, what's my brain going to think of next? Uh, well, that's ludicrous. No, you are the thinking person who makes the choices. And when second law of thermodynamics takes over the body, it's decaying in the grave. Where will you be? The person who made those choices. You are going to be held accountable by the creator who gave you the ability to make choices, who gave you life as an opportunity to know him, to appreciate him. And you have, you're guilty of grand larceny. It is worse than that. You have torn out of his hands the life that he gives you to use it for your own selfish ends. And you think he's going to allow that to happen? Judgment will come. Judgment will come. Now, they complain. Well, look, if this is a good God who made this universe, I think you need to have a few answers. I had a three-hour conversation with this man yesterday. I tell you, he asked many questions, a lot of good questions. Well, if God created everything, who made God? Okay, well, uh, that's a ridiculous question. Well, then who made the God, the God that made him? And so on. It's like um, Sir Fred Hoyle said, well, no, he believes in pans, uh, panspermia, that life came to earth from somewhere else. We can't explain life on earth because it must have come from somewhere else. But yeah, but how did it get there? Uh, or the extraterrestrials planted it here. But who planted them there? And who planted them there, 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 and so forth? It's, it's nonsense. But we better come up with some answers to these things and know them. Peter said, 1 Peter 3.15, Be ready always to give an answer to everyone who asks a reason of the hope that is in you. Can you give a reason why do you believe in God? Why do you believe the Bible is God's word? Well, wait a minute. How could a good God allow suffering? you got children, babies born that are doomed from birth. you got the disease and the poverty and the famine. you got wars. And look at this world. It is a mess. How could a God, good God create that? He didn't create it. We created it. This is not the world God made. It's a world we've made. Uh, I have a lot of illustrations. I don't remember whether I've ever used any of these here. But we're walking along a lake shore. There's a fish in the water. Beautiful. It looks out on the shore. It sees a man sitting there smoking a cigar, holding the fishing pole. And it looks out and it's enviously and says, now that would really be living. So manages to get out of the lake. It tries to get up on a chair. It can't, can't grab a fishing pole. And it's flopping around in the dirt and gravel. Gills gasping for air it can't get, dying. And one of these atheists walks along, and he says, look at that. What kind of a god would create a fish to suffer like that? No, God did not create the fish to suffer like that. He created the fish to swim in water. And the problem with the fish is it was not content to be what God made it to be, and it tried to be something else. Now, that has very serious consequences. Eternal punishment. People ask me about that all the time. Eternal punishment? What kind of a God would punish people forever? Well, he's not really punishing you. He has separated you from his presence because you didn't want to have anything to do with him. He's given you what you wanted, and now you've got yourself to deal with. And Jesus talked about thirst. If any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. As the heart pants after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. God made us eternal beings. Why? Because he loved us so much. He wanted us to be able to enjoy his fellowship forever. He wanted us in his presence forever. Okay? Now that has serious consequences. Water he uses water as an example. Water is absolutely essential for life. Why does thirst feel so painful 
Why is it such a torment if you're dying of thirst? Because water is absolutely essential for your life. I believe that heaven will feel so good for the same reason that hell feels so bad. Because God made us for himself. And we cannot have real joy and peace and, and love uh, except in full communion with him. And if a person has cut themselves off from God, it's like a man crawling across the Sahara Desert. You put a canteen of water to his mouth, and he keeps knocking it away. They're dying, eternally dying of a burning thirst for God. And I believe they are haunted by their conscience. They can try to escape conscience now through entertainment or sex or pleasure or wealth, whatever it is. But one day, when you're alone, and God's holiness, his purity, his justice, his truth is burning like a fire. You cannot escape it. And you know that what you've done has been rebellion against your creator. And you know that you don't have to be there. Jesus paid the penalty for your sins. And you brushed him aside. And this is your eternal eternal experience. Wow. I think hell really will exist because God loves us so much. He wanted us to be in his presence forever. Well, you're going to be somewhere forever. So you might share that with some of your skeptical friends. It's a very solemn thing, and I think we as Christians, I think about it often, I don't think we realize what an awesome thing it is to rebel against God. Wow. And my people have forgotten me days without number, God says. Did you tell God you love him today? Did you thank Jesus today for dying for your sins? See, we can go on through life. Well, I know I'm grateful, but Lord, when do I ever tell you? Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus, for taking the penalty I deserve for dying for me. Thank you, God. I don't, I don't give thanks for the food without saying, Lord, thank you for the health and strength you've given me to partake of it. I'm not worthy of anything. You are so loving and so gracious. We need to give him a little more gratitude, a little more thanks, and a little more reverent awe of who he really is is. Father, thank you for your love. Oh, God. When we, like the psalmist, consider your heavens, the works of your fingers, the moon and the stars that thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? Lord, we are nothing. We, we have a sense of self-importance. It's incredible that we ever could. He who thinks himself to be something when he's nothing is, deceives himself. Lord, we need to just bow in full submission to you, not out of fear, out of awesome reverence, but, Lord, out of love. You loved us so much. You've given us your Son to die for our sins. Lord Jesus, we owe you everything. Father God, we owe you our love, our obedience. Lord, we want to be what you want us to be. And we want to experience the fullness of your purpose for our lives in redeeming us. Help us to win others to Christ. And Lord, use us to your glory to rescue many, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I was talking about so-called biochemical imbalances and psychiatric drugs and so forth. And uh, I should have told you, no matter how bad these things are, and they are bad, Peter Bregan, 
<clears throat> pardon me, Peter Bregan, whom I quoted, one of the world's leading authorities on this, says that the psychiatric drugs, psychotropic drugs that we give to cure our patients in America, they used the same ones in the Soviet Union to torture their people, okay? But if you are on such drugs, don't get off of them except under a doctor's uh, guidance. You can't just quit. You got yourself hooked on something. The doctor did. But I'm going to read a couple of other statements by Peter Bregan. I'll remind you, because there are an awful lot of people involved in this, I'll remind you uh, of the title of his book, Your Drug May Be Your Problem. Okay? The drug they gave you to cure your problem may be your problem. He's a psychiatrist, one of the world's leading experts on drugs. I'll just give you a couple of other quotes from him. He says, No biochemical imbalances have ever been documented with certainty in association with any psychiatric diagnosis. Shock you? Their existence is pure speculation inspired by those who advocate drugs. There are no known biochemical imbalances and no tests for them. Okay? He says, what, what happens when we start viewing a human being as an object. We talked about materialism this morning. We're just a bag of molecules, lump, lump of protein molecules wired with nerves and so forth. He says, we lose our own capacity for rationality and for love. It is impossible to reduce a person's emotional suffering to biochemical aberrations without doing something psychologically and morally destructive to that person. We reduce the reality of that individual's life to a narrowly focused speculation about brain chemistry. Thus, in their efforts to be objective and scientific, biological psychiatrists and doctors end up doing very destructive things to people, including themselves. We talked a bit about that uh, this morning. I quoted, I'll quote him again. Remember, this is uh, Francis Crick. You, this is his book, The Astonishing Hypothesis. Why does he call it astonishing? Because it's ridiculous. Common sense would say that's not true. But he says, here's, here's his astonishing hypothesis. You, your joys, your sorrows, your memories, your ambitions, your sense of personal identity and free will are in fact no more than the behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. Okay, the, the famous Francis Crick, co-founder, co-discoverer of DNA and so forth. Now, I want to just quote you, I'm going to get off of this, but I want to quote you uh, Richard Dawkins again. He acknowledges, quote, now Richard Dawkins, uh, again, one of the world's leading geneticists and evolutionists, wrote The Selfish Gene, big seller. He says, the account of the origin of life that I shall give is necessarily speculative. By definition, nobody was around to see what happened. Well, so what's the point of speculating? It's all meaningless anyway. Just product of a big bang. He he then offers bold assertions intermingled with a litany of uncertainty. 
Typical are the following. I just picked these words and phrases all on one page. Probably. We do not know. Must have. Perhaps. At some point. Formed by accident. May not necessarily. That's in one page. This is the great scientist. And he's going to tell you how life began. He continues. This may seem a very unlikely sort of accident. You're just a bunch of accidents. So it was. It was exceedingly improbable. Let me tell you how improbable it is. Sir Fred Hoyle, mathematician, he said, look, you can't have any life without enzymes. Now, what, is the, what are the mathematical odds that by chance you could get the molecules that are necessary for the enzymes essential for life lined up in the right order by chance? He calculated it on his computer. It's a simple mathematical formula. 10 to the minus 40,000. Now, if you are a long time since you took math or you, you don't understand that, let me explain that number. That is one chance in one with 40,000 zeros after it. Okay? Now, you don't even know what that number is. I mean, it's, it's beyond our comprehension. I'll give you an idea about that number. What are the chances... My initials are D-H. Actually, they're D-C-H-H. -H. My father named me David Charles Haddon Spurgeon Hunt. The, <laughs> the, the Cal Calvinists would be interested to know that. Uh, I was named after Spurgeon. My mother, Redline Spurgeon. So my official name is David Charles Haddon Hunt. Okay. Anyway, so there is an atom one atom in this universe, out there somewhere, it has my initials on it, okay? We're zooming through space at hyperspeed, and I reach out, what do you know? <laughs> I got the atom with my initials on it. What are the odds? Very simple, 10 to the minus 80. One chance in one with 80 zeros after it. All right, let's take every atom in the universe. Let's make another universe out of every atom in the universe. Now we're zooming through at hyperspeed, and I reach out. What do you know? I got it again. <laughs> what are the odds? Well, you kids that are taking math, you know, when you multiply, you add integers. 10 to the minus 160. What? 10 to the minus 40,000? You got to be kidding. And Sir Fred Hoyle says, it is impossible. You would never get life by chance. And he says, they all know it. Why do they keep teaching it? Because it's academically respected. And if you don't, you lose your tenure, or you don't make it. Okay, they're not going to publish your papers. Okay, now I should say a little more then, since I brought that up. The evolutionist says, wait a minute, you can't just do it by mathematical odds. That's just dead things. Uh, you, you forget we're dealing with natural selection. We're dealing with survival of the fittest. This is, these are living things. You know, they can go against the second law of thermodynamics. Well, look, folks, we already explained it. You can't even get the first um, cell, let alone build an eye with the rods and cones and nerves and lenses and, and so forth. You can't even get the first cell. There's no natural selection. You understand what I'm saying? There is no natural selection operating to overcome the second law of thermodynamics 
until the eye works. You got it? Don't forget that. It can't help survival if it doesn't work. Okay? Secondly, remember, you got all these pieces that are going to become an eye. Somehow you're going to get them together. But if they don't help survival, natural selection is going to do away with them. Are you following? Please don't forget that. You cannot get it. It will not happen. So going back to going back to uh, Dawkins, this may seem a very unlikely sort of accident. <laughs> well, <laughs> it sure is. Uh, so it was exceedingly improbable in the lifetime. Well, exceedingly improbable. <laughs> Worse than that. In, in the lifetime of a man, things that are improbable can be treated for practical purposes as impossible. But we are not used to dealing in hundreds of millions of years. Here comes the billions of years. Why do they need billions of years? Well, that's the silk hat out of which they pull all their miracles. Uh, <laughs> Well, it couldn't happen, 10 to the minus 40,000, but in billions of years. No, never. Okay, so anyway, so how do we deal with these people? See, one of the things that I have noticed in reading, I'm reading both sides. What do the creationists say? What do the evolutionists say? Well, what do you think I noticed? That the creationists overlook. I haven't found a creationist who brings up, and this is our title, the overlooked irrefutable proof. What's the overlooked irrefutable proof? Mm -hmm. Well, we'll come to that. <laughs> um, my father used to tell a story. I don't think I mentioned this ever on, on this platform, I don't think. Um, he, he used to speak at uh, Speaker's Corner in Hyde Park. Anybody ever, how many of you have been to Hyde Park? Okay. Uh, they love to argue there. Not the greatest place to get somebody to listen to you. They want to shout you down. But anyway, this is many years ago in the 1800s, and this speaker quoted... The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And anybody who doesn't believe in God is a fool. And the guy starts yelling, wait a minute, I'm an atheist. You said you can prove atheists are fools. If you can't prove right now that I'm a fool, we'll publish this in the papers and we'll run you out of town. The preacher says, you're an atheist. Yes, sir. You don't believe in God. No, I don't believe in God. I've been fighting against God all my life. Well, <laughs> well, the preacher said, tell me, a man who fights against something that doesn't exist, if he's not a fool, who is? Uh, now, <clears throat> now, that's a cute story, <laughs> but it's not going to quite make it. Now, somebody else was it yesterday? Yes. That told me another approach. Well, you say, and this is what they say. They say, God? That's just like Santa Claus or the Tooth Fairy. So what do you say? Well, you don't spend your time fighting against Santa Claus or the Tooth Fairy. You don't write books against Santa Claus or the Tooth Fairy <laughs> and publish your arguments about... How come you do this about God? <laughs> if they're just on the same level, okay? They know that God exists. Now, Billy Graham, in his autobiography, I probably mentioned this before here, I'm not sure. He tells of his friend Chuck Templeton. Anybody remember the story of Chuck Templeton? Very few. Chuck Templeton, I never heard him, him preach. But he was Billy's partner in the early days. Young men, they used to preach together. They traveled to England together and so forth. The people who heard him said he was a whole lot better preacher than Billy. 
Well, Chuck Templeton said, you know, I think God could use me a whole lot more if I would go back to seminary and get a PhD in theology. So he went back to Princeton, totally apostate, even back in those days, in the 40s, went back to Princeton to get his PhD in theology. Well, I can tell you, I found out that theologians are the worst ones. They're worse than the scientists in, in these universities and so forth. And what do you know? In the process, he lost his faith. No, he never had his faith. Good thing that he found out. He became an atheist. And Billy Graham tells you how Chuck, his, his buddy, contacted him and said, Billy, there are unscientific statements in the Bible. They just won't hold up under modern science. There are psychologically unsound statements in the Bible. There are contradictions in the Bible. It's not the word of God. And Billy tells you, he says, it shook me to the core. Now, how did Billy deal with this? Well, he says, I got on my knees and I prayed, oh God, Chuck has showed me that there are unscientific statements in the Bible, there are contradictions in the Bible, things that just simply aren't true, not historically accurate, and so forth, and I don't have an answer to any of them, but I'm going to take it by faith that this is your word. Now, I hope you all understand that will not fly. Your 18-year-old son comes back from first semester at university. Mom, Dad, I mean, the professor, he showed me there are things in the Bible that just aren't true. They're not scientifically accurate. There are contradictions and so forth. Would you please help me? Take it by faith. Well, a Muslim can take the Quran by faith, if that's what you call it. A, a, a Mormon is even ahead of the game. He's got a burning in the bosom, uh, you know. Uh, well, a Buddhist, oh, I believe what Buddha said, and so forth. That, by the way, is not faith. We talk about that Sunday, God willing. That is not faith. Look, if you can show me something in this book that is not true, that is not scientifically accurate, that's not historically accurate, contradictions and so forth, I'll throw this thing out. It couldn't be God's word. Are you following me? There are no contradictions. There, is no, there are no inaccuracies in here. And anybody that says there are does not know what they're talking about. Now, I may not be able to solve the problem immediately. Oh, when I was in university, uh, UCLA, no offense to you people out here in the East, but anyway, <laughs> I read everything I could find that the skeptics, the critics, the atheists had said and written against the Bible. I wanted to know what they had to say. Now, I can tell you the more I read, the more it strengthened my faith. They had such pitiful arguments. Really, they've got nothing to say, okay? Now, there's some of them that are very clever. But anyway, 1 Peter 3.15, you all know that. Be ready always, not sometimes, always to give an answer to everyone who asks for the most exciting religious experience you ever had with the Lord. <laughs> no, who asks for a reason. Can you give me a reason? Why do you believe in God? Well, it's, it's, I have this wonderful feeling. God exists and so forth. I sing, oh, how I love Jesus. Jesus is the sweetest name. I know, you know. But tell me why. Why do you believe that Jesus is God? Why do you believe he died for your sins and rose from the dead? Are you really sure? Well, I just take it by faith. You better have some reasons. You'd be a fool to believe what you're not sure is true. 
And that is a big problem. We raise a lot of young people in our Sunday schools and our churches. They've had some emotional experience or they're going along with the crowd, but they couldn't tell you why they believe what they say they believe. And they are on very dangerous ground because they're going to come up with all kinds of people who will just take that away from them with logical arguments and and so forth. Well, we better be able to answer every man. I'm not saying, look, I've knocked on more doors than Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, I've gone to the beach and out in the streets and everywhere on university campuses, cold turkey, walking up to anybody that would listen to me. Uh, this guy says, how do you know you're not just something in a jar? You know, you get all, all kinds of... All kinds of things. And I can tell you that I have gone back back home, got on my knees, licking my wounds, and saying, God, I didn't have an answer for this guy. Came up with a question I never heard before. Lord, please help me. Show me. Okay. A little more study. I've got the answer. Next time somebody asks me that question... I know how to respond. But I'm not saying you're going to know everything about every, you know, religion and so forth. But I often, but you you can learn. But I often say to people, you don't, you can't live long enough to, because I, I meet people on airplanes that, well, they're studying religion. Studying, uh, Um, you know, Buddhism or Hinduism. Well, I can tell them a lot about all those things, but I don't even try to do that. I say, look, you wouldn't live long enough to become an expert on all the world's religions. I I can make a suggestion. could save you a lot of time. You go to the Bible first. Why would you go to the Bible first? For a number of reasons, but one of them is the Bible says all the rest of them are wrong. Now, if you can prove that the Bible is true, you saved yourself a lot of time. (laughs) And we can prove that the Bible is true. 